Odds are you're watching this video, you know what the Spider-Verse is, probably because you've seen the movie Into the Spider-Verse, which was released in 2018. There's also the recently released Across the Spider-Verse. Whilst this movie thrust the concept of the Spider-Verse firmly into the mainstream, it wasn't at all the first piece of Spider-Man media created to revolve around the concept. Before the movie came the first Spider-Verse comic in 2014, which introduced now iconic characters like Spider-Gwen. But even further back in 2010, there was a game made by Beanox and published by Activision called Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, which you may or may not have played. It was released on the PS3, Xbox 360, DS, Wii, and PC. Technically, yes, the Verse Spider-Verse event can be traced back to 1998, in the Season 5 two-part finale of Spider-Man the Animated Series. These two episodes involved the main Spider-Man leading a group of a bunch of other Spider-Man variants against Spider-Carnage, another alternate evil version of himself. You also see in Shattered Dimensions there's an item called the Tablet of Order and Chaos which is very essential to the story. That actually draws inspiration from the Tablet of Time in the animated series. So you could consider this the origin but I just mainly consider it important because Mark Hoffmeyer worked on the first of the two episodes in this arc which is episode 12 of season 5 and he would later go on to be one of the two main writers for Shattered Dimensions. The other main writer of Shattered Dimensions other than Mark Hoffmeyer was Dan Slott who went on to write the Spider-Verse comics which in turn led to Into the Spider-Verse. But the thing is, despite having mostly positive reception, Shattered Dimensions seems like it's often forgotten or not talked about. I mean, I literally forgot to mention the game in my Carnage video, which, you know, you all made very clear to me. And the reason for this can most likely be attributed to Activision's deal with Marvel expiring in 2014, which caused the game to be completely delisted from PlayStation Network and Xbox Live. Because of this, the only way you could actually buy the game was through a hard copy, which made the game unreasonably expensive. Even as a kid, it was almost impossible for me to get my hands on the game. It was just really elusive, so I don't think many people actually got the chance to play it. It was relisted on Steam in 2015, but then delisted again in 2017. On April Fools, no less. That's not funny, guys. Anyways, I played the game. So sit down, because we're going to go through the whole thing. I did not play the DS version, uh, which is the only version that's just an entirely different game. But, you know, I don't know. We'll include a section at the end where I talk about it. It might just be a hidden gem. You know, who knows? The game immediately begins with a 3D animated cutscene, which looks pretty nice, might I add, narrated by Stan Lee. So Mysterio is breaking into a museum to retrieve the Tablet of Order and Chaos so that he can sell it on the black market and make a ton of money. He's interrupted by Spider-Man, who takes the tablet away from him. This incarnation of Spider-Man, who I'll be calling Amazing from now on, is actually voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. Assassin is the best kind of friend. This might be kind of familiar because he also voiced Spider-Man in 2003's The New Animated Series. Pedestrians, you almost hit with a truck? No, not them. You must mean the guard you nearly electrocuted. He does a pretty good job. In general, you'll notice that the voice direction of this entire game is just kind of superb. Because the voice director is Jamie Thompson, who was also the voice director for The Spectacular Spider-Man. So Amazing accidentally breaks the Tablet of Order and Chaos whilst trying to beat Mysterio, breaking it up into various fragments. Mysterio disappears and then Madam Web appears, telling Amazing that he just shattered the most powerful mystical artifact in the world. And somehow, all of the pieces of the fragment got scattered across three other dimensions all linked by the theme of past, present, future. Spider-Man Noir, Ultimate Spider-Man, and Spider-Man 2099. So whilst Madam Web is explaining the existence of other dimensions, you can kind of catch a glimpse here of a couple of spider variants in the background. So Amazing himself notices and calls out Spider-Ham. I'm gonna try my best to name everyone I can recognize, but there's a weird filter placed on top of it. Some of them are out of frame and they're not on screen for very long. So there's honestly a lot I can't make heads or tails of. Who is this? I actually don't know. There's Mangaverse Spider-Man. You see Mayday Parker here. Spider-Man with a cape from What If. A Japanese Spider-Man is here too, which was a shock to me. I forgot to mention another thing from this game other than Carnage. And and of course, in the background, you can see Noir, Ultimate, and 2099. This one's really hard to make out, but I think it's supposed to be Spider Armor Mark 1. I don't really know. I can't really tell. Anyway, so Madam Web tells Amazing that she's already informed 2099, Noir, and Ultimate on the current situation, and that they will assist in finding the fragments. If they don't find all the pieces of the tablet, then all of their realities will be completely destroyed. So this is the tutorial. It's the part of the game where you introduce to each Spider-Man alongside the general game mechanics. They all get their own tutorial section. Each covers something different. Amazing covers basic movement, running, jumping, climbing, as well as web pulling. Then after you get the fragment as him, the game transitions into Ultimate, who is just beautifully voiced by Josh Keaton. The black suit! What am I doing in the black suit? I, I hate this thing! As you might know, is the voice of Spider-Man from 2008's Spectacular Spider-Man. We made a pretty good team. 
Maybe you should change sides. Adam Webb gives him the black suit, claiming he's going to need it to achieve all the pieces of the tablet. He's initially very reluctant due to his past experiences with the black suit, but she insists that her psychic powers will keep it from taking over his body. This section has you learning how to web zip, as well as covering web swinging. 2099's section covers the basics of combat, where you fight a bunch of members of the public eye. He's voiced by Dan Gilvezan, who actually voiced Spider-Man in 1981's Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. I tried to defeat him in cards once. It didn't go so good. Norman Osborn's become the Green Goblin again. When I was younger, this is where I got filtered. I guess I just really, really sucked at stealth games. Uh, Spider-Man Noir is voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes, who voiced Spider-Man in 1994's The Animated Series. This used to be such a nice place. Swing through the air. Why are we sneaking in the front door? Is where the game takes a very fundamental shift. Unlike the previous three sections, which are all quite fluid in how their mechanics apply to each other, Noir has his own completely distinct style of levels, so he sneaks around and performs stealth takedowns to progress. He will rarely engage in beat-em-up style combat unless he's specifically placed in a section that is designed around it, which happens a few times throughout the game. 90% of the time though, you're just going to be sneaking around. It's a pretty bold move because he's kind of the black sheep of the four characters, and I don't think it's in a particularly good way either, since the stealth mechanics feel very unrefined and shallow. I mean, Arkham Asylum came out in 2009. Granted, that game is primarily stealth focused and it's not balancing multiple gameplay styles. Uh, and I'm sure that the circumstances behind its development, you know, makes it hardly comparable. So it makes sense it has more mechanical depth than Noir's gameplay. But I still believe that giving Noir his own unique gameplay style at the expense of mechanical depth was not really a great idea as much as I like the concept. It's pretty boring and uh, not very polished. And you'll later find that the upgrade system changes basically nothing about how effective Noir is at actually approaching these levels. This isn't to say that the Noir sections are all terrible though, I mean they're just very hit or miss. Madam Web also gives Noir web powers such as being able to web swing which he couldn't originally do in his debut miniseries, which is just to bring him a little more in line with how the other incarnations of Spider-Man control. She does the same with 2099 who doesn't actually normally have a spider sense. Once you get the fragment as Noir, another cutscene's gonna start. Madam Web will warn Amazing that enemies will be inevitably drawn to the power of the pieces of the the tablet. Mysterio gets his hand on one of the fragments. One thing I really like about this game is that Mysterio is kind of the main villain. I don't know, I just, I just like Mysterio. So with that, you know, you finish the tutorial, and one thing I want to mention, actually, is that I think this game is very visually impressive. I think it captures the comic book aesthetic of Spider-Man extremely well, even giving each Spider-Man their own distinct visual style when you're playing as them. Amazing is more cel-shaded, whilst Ultimate imitates that of early 2000s comics, nor is gritty dark realism, and 2099 also targets a more grounded art style that's set in a sci-fi setting of the distant future. It really does make each level feel very distinct. So, you know, the first level's now unlocked, where you get to play as amazing. I'm gonna spoil it now, this is Craven. Now, the way the game is structured is that each level is themed around fighting a specific villain of that Spider-Man incarnation done in three sets of four villains. So Amazing, Noir, 2099 and Ultimate get three villains each for a total of 12 levels and then one final level. But I'm not gonna spoil the rest of the villains because I think that might be kind of half the fun. Just wondering who's gonna show up, you know? If you wanna keep it as a surprise, you probably shouldn't look at the video's chapters though because uh, their name will be there. Don't hover over the timeline, don't do it. The so Craven's level starts with a cutscene of Amazing swinging around the city. Earlier, Madam Web upgraded the spider sense of each Spider-Man beyond their normal capabilities so that they're able to detect the fragments as well as see enemies through walls. This is basically just their nifty little way of explaining their version of the detective mode mechanic from the Arkham games. He finds it inside a jungle room, which of course belongs to Craven and is laid full of traps. And when he does actually manage to grab it, he gets knocked unconscious by sleeping gas. Then he wakes up in a big jungle and you get to play the game. So there are these funny little tokens above the level and uh, collecting them just makes a really nice noise. <laughs> This was pretty much half the fun of the game for me. I just love collecting shiny things. I'm like a magpie. So you reach a big gate where Craven's holding the glowing fragment piece and he challenges you to a gauntlet wherein the piece of the tablet is the prize. So when this is over, you'll fulfill the criteria for the first challenge in what the game calls the Web of Destiny. The way the progression works in this game is that you have to complete a certain number of challenges to unlock access to upgrades. Then you use Spider Essence to buy the upgrades. You acquire Spider Essence from collecting emblems and completing challenges as well as beating levels. So initially I started tracking the challenges, but most of the challenges are incredibly basic things you're probably just going to do anyway without thinking, like dodging attacks or defeating a certain number of enemies or collecting a certain number of emblems. I went through pretty much the whole game without really looking at the Web of Destiny and I ended up completing about like two thirds of all the challenges. The upgrades are split into combat upgrades and character upgrades. Generally speaking, I found that the character upgrades were just a lot better, but some combat upgrades and I mean really just a, a handful few are pretty useful. Also amazing, just really like saying bingo bango bongo. He's just going to come out with it every now and then. 
Bingo, bango, bongo. At some point, the game will give you access to web striking. Now, anyone who has played a Spider-Man game before knows that web striking just tends to be overpowered or just useful. Just by design, this is something usually very good about it. But in this game, it sucks. Whenever you web strike, there is a very solid chance the spider sense indicator will appear above your head and that time will just slow down, meaning you're guaranteed to get hit unless you do a web strike evade, which will make you jump behind them. So it's just kind of a waste of time, unless there's an enemy that specifically requires you to do it, such as certain enemies with shields, which appear later on in the game. Yeah, I got stuck in this area for like a really, really long time. I don't actually know why. I just kind of wandered aimlessly looking to see if there was like an enemy I missed, but it just seemed bugged until I walked into a certain spot and Madame Webb just said, that solves that. And then the door opened. This is where the game starts trying to be a bit quirky, right? A bit quirky at the cost of, you know, being fun. You get to this open area with a bunch of trees and a guy trying to snipe you. This is not just the worst part of this whole level, but it's one of the worst parts in the whole game because the camera angle completely changes to the perspective of the sniper. Does this look fun to control? Because it's not. You have to trick the sniper into shooting the trees so that they fall down and form a bridge for you to cross. I'm pretty sure Spider-Man can make that jump or just swing across, but okay. When you finally get past the modern day torture device is this section, you reach a stadium where a big enemy shows up. These guys are pretty straightforward. You just you just smack them, you roll away, you just smack them, and then the circle button appears above their head. Two more drop down, but then Craven knocks them both out and the first boss fight of the game begins. It's uh, very simple stuff really. He lunges at you, you roll out of the way, then you attack him. Sometimes he makes spikes come out the floor and you have to web zip kick him and sometimes the game turns into punch out. There are sections in this game where you go first person and the left and right joysticks let you throw three different types of punches with each fist whilst pulling them both backwards will let you dodge. These sections are just simple fun. They're honestly very satisfying. You get to just get through hands. In general this game they seemed quite fascinated by the concept of putting the the camera into first person. You'll notice this with cutscenes, they do it a lot. I'm not really complaining though, it's kinda, yeah, it's kinda cute, it's kinda cool. This continues until you eventually manage to beat Craven, and then you'll send him flying through the stadium. When you pursue and confront him, he'll lament over how you made fun of him so bad that all of his men left him. Out of desperation, he'll power himself up using the fragment, which will give him super speed and super strength. The final section of the level is a vertical one, where you have to web pull and press five different switches as you ascend up the room, fighting a bunch of enemies at each switch. Once you pull all five switches, the platform will send you all the way to the top and into an open arena, where you engage in the final fight against the powered up Kraven. So this boss fight is very similar to the first one, which is a pattern that most of the bosses in the game tend to follow, except now that Kraven can dodge your attacks, throw his weapons, and he has a charge attack. He can't do the spike floor thing anymore, so instead he just randomly jumps onto pillars for no, no reason other than to give you the opportunity to attack him. Also, when I got him at like around 50% health or less, he started using explosives, just straight up blowing shit. Oh. At the end of the fight, you have to web strike him to finish him off, where it will seamlessly transition into a cutscene of you retrieving the fragment. I mean, I thought the, you know, I mean, I thought the level was pretty okay, especially as an introductory level. Uh, unfortunately, the bad news is that this is Amazing's best level. It is all downhill for him from here. Now we get to the noir level. So he's running on the rooftops, and he comes across some goons carrying a fragment. The noir version of Hammerhead, created just for this game, by the way, not pulled from any prior source material, shows himself putting some goons in their place and telling them to follow the orders that the goblin gave them. Stop gawking and start throwing legs. Yes, that is John DiMaggio as Hammerhead, and he does a beautiful job, just as he did in Spectacular Spider-Man. Yeah, means nothing and no one can hurt you. And Adventure Time. They load the fragment into their car and they drive off, but Noir catches a ride on the back using his webs. The car comes to a halt and Hammerhead warns his henchmen to kill Spider-Man on sight, which then instigates the start of the level. You do some takedowns on some guys until Hammerhead moves forward and then brings out a hostage. Most of Noir's core gameplay loop generally involves a hostage. You'll do some stealth takedowns on the enemies, and then you'll rescue the hostage, but they will never kill the hostage, even if you get seen hundreds of times, for some reason. Noir has a ridiculous amount of range for these takedowns, so you get a lot of leniency in doing it. Once you rescue the hostage, they'll help you to progress to the next part of the level, generally to just rescue more hostages. So you'll probably notice by now, the AI is dumb as bricks. Uh, kinda works in the game's favor, though, because I feel like it would have been unbelievably frustrating if they were overtuned. Making the AI smart is only gonna actually feel better to play if Noir himself feels like more responsive, capable and versatile at dealing with the situations presented to the player. Which he doesn't. What you've seen him do already is the extent of his moveset and no upgrades change that. Like I said, he's very out of place. So one thing I thought was really cool is that whilst in the shadows uh, and undetectable by enemies, the visuals are actually in black and white and the color returns when you're in the light. Noir also has a different run animation 
It's just a very cute stylistic thing. I thought it was neat. And it can sometimes be useful, I guess, to determine if you can be seen or not. I mean, I never really used it to that end, but I don't know. I'm sure someone has. After this cutscene plays, you're kind of in this pseudo cutscene where you can only slowly walk. Just let me move. I just want the emblem. I just want the emblem. When can I move? Okay, cool. So, uh, if you're asking, well, what if you just try to fight them instead of doing stealth? Uh, I completely mess up my stealth takedown here and I try fighting the guy and he doesn't really flinch at all. They're not really affected by your attacks and they do a ton of damage. So it's just kind of best to run away and just try again. But I think I saw some platinum metal runs of Noir's stages and the guy was just going around beating the out of everyone. So maybe it actually is optimal. Maybe I just don't know the method. a close one. Hammerhead speaks like he's British, which is really bizarre. I don't know if it's just because I'm British or the fact that he clearly is not British. The delivery of this line sounds so wrong, <laughs> so wrong to me. Come on and have a go if you think you're hard enough. This is kind of a trend in the noir setting in this game in general. Like they like to give some of the enemies British sayings to further reinforce the mobster caricature they're trying to capture. Regardless, with that, the first Hammerhead boss of the level starts and uh, it's extremely simple. You avoid the lights, you sneak up behind Behind him and then you do a takedown for huge damage. They try to approach the design of Noir's bosses in a way that keeps the stealth element at the core, which I can appreciate, but a lot of the time it ends up being very shallow and it can get repetitive very quickly. After you beat him, he pretends to give up, then he hits you with the most telegraphed headbutt of all time. Okay, no, forget spider sense, right? You have eyeballs. You rescue about five hostages from a bunch of goons in this section of the level. Then you get thrown into the first major shakeup of the formula so far. A beat em up section on some train tracks where you have to balance dodging running trains with fighting a bunch of henchmen, including some giant ones. It, it sounds marginally cooler than it actually is, but I still kind of had fun. At this point, Hammerhead has powered himself up with the fragment, just like the Craven level. This is structured so that you fight Hammerhead normally and then fight a powered up version at the end of the level. In this fight, you have to trick Hammerhead into shooting a gas canister so that he fills the room with smoke, which allows you to hide and then perform a takedown. Yeah, I keep trying to throw barrels at him during this fight and uh, it doesn't do anything. At some point, there were no more gas canisters, so I was like, hmm, I know what the game wants me to do next. But then Hammerhead just like ran into the wall. I was able to play punch out until I beat him again. I can't even tell you how you're actually supposed to beat this boss, assuming he's not just supposed to run into the wall for no reason. Anyway, the level's kind of mid. It was alright, I guess. 2099's first level catapults you straight into a brand new villain made just for this game. Hobgoblin2099. He's cool. I like him. Uh, he's voiced by Steve Blum. Yes, and with its power, I'm going to tear this world apart! <laughs> automatic plus 100 points. This level starts off not only with 2099 diving off a building, but my FPS diving too. The Hobgoblin level was very action-packed. It feels like it doesn't follow the formula of the other levels at all, instead feeling more like a constant boss fight throughout the entire thing. The dive sequence has you fighting in mid-air and then quickly transitioning into a boss fight when you land. It's actually really cool. I mean, the boss itself, it's nothing too special. You just kind of throw his bombs back at him, or, you know, you can use a web shot to make him drop them on himself. Sometimes he dives dives at you, roll out the way, you start smacking him around. Then he flies away, prompting you to pursue him by swinging after him and fighting against a ton of armed men from the public eye who are dressed like dudes from Tron. We haven't even got to Ultimate yet, but even just comparing 2099's combat to Amazing's, it just immediately feels so much better. His attacks are quicker, and also, I'm just gonna say right now that his upgrades are far better. Particularly his charge attack that he gets is actually useful. So when you get far enough in the level, it will introduce you to 2099's unique gimmick, Accelerated Vision which will slow down time for everyone except you. I mostly use this as an escape button or a get off me tool, but I think it's supposed to be used against his homing rockets. I don't think I ever used it as it was intended throughout the entire course of the game because it never really felt that useful. So Hobgoblin appears once again at half health this time as to suggest that he's still kind of feeling the sting from your last battle. This is the exact same boss again. After you beat him, you'll climb your way up some shattered pieces of window that conveniently broke in such a way that it formed the perfect path. I don't know how he's not shattering this. You chase Hobgoblin off of the top of the building and into another dive sequence. This time, you can ram Hobgoblin into your surroundings after grabbing him. These sections are extremely simple, but they're just kind of a treat to look at and they make you feel really cool. It's also another thing unique to 2099's gameplay style, which I can appreciate. After you land, 2099 deduces that Hobgoblin was created by somebody due to the nanofiber mesh in his wings. You fight off a bunch of guys in the public eye, but not before collecting this really satisfying cluster of emblems. I told you, collecting emblems is like half the fun. I don't know why they don't just make like a full-on Spider-Man collector thought. I would play it. Then you 
you fight Hobgoblin again. And it's the same boss again. So one thing I've neglected to talk about up until now is actually the game's soundtrack. The soundtrack is very, very good. So the soundtrack, the way it works is that with each level, the tracks are dynamic. There's generally about three or four versions of one song, which is supposed to signpost your progression throughout the level. As the music grows more intense, the further you get. Near the end of the Hobgoblin level for 2099, this track starts to play. which uh, might sound kind of familiar if you've been keeping up with the trailers for Across the Spider-Verse. They actually reused this motif from 2099's first level in the game in Across the Spider-Verse. This honestly kind of blew my mind, so I thought I'd just include it here. So next time you encounter Hobgoblin, though, is the final fight of the level against his powered-up version where he summons, like, three gargoyles to fight against you and turns everything red. Looks pretty cool, right? Then, once you defeat the gargoyles by just web-striking them, he starts raining bombs on you as he flies over. These are all brand-new attacks to Unique Boss. It is a brand-new... This is actually one of my favorite levels in the entire game. Not only because I think it's pretty fun to play, all things considered, but because Electro is hilarious. So you start off at a power plant. I tried to grab this emblem, but quickly realized you're just kind of stuck in pseudo cutscene walking mode until you go near Electro. Then I get the emblem. The enemies in this level are these tiny little electric gremlins, and they come in different colors, which signifies how durable they are and what they can do. So once you defeat them all, the tunnel entrance is cleared of electricity and you're able to progress. I've neglected to mention these until now, but on top of the emblems are also these hidden spiders. Golden spiders that are crawling on a wall somewhere in the level. These get you quite a bit of spider essence and there's eight of them in each level, but I don't really go out of my way to collect them. Electro breaks the water pump and you have to save three hostages whilst a stock alarm sound is just blaring in the background. Huge fan of the voice lines for the hostages in this game because each separate voice actor has been given the exact same line to say. You're gonna hear a lot of the water's electrified. Help me! you rescue them all, you enter a boss fight against Electro, and you fight him on the center platform until he perches atop one of the surrounding platforms. Then you web zip kick him to continue the fight. He shoots a big blue beam and does a lot of teleport. Does that sound familiar? The highlight of the Electro fights is the stuff he comes out with. Just listen to some of these lines. <laughs> you pathetic! Booyah! You're gonna get all. Oh yeah! Got he flies off to drain some more generators to get even stronger. So you chase him as he summons more electric gremlins for you to fight. A key design choice in Ultimate's levels that sets it apart from the other spider man is that all of the enemies die in, you know, like one or two or three hits. But there's a swarm of them coming at you. This works really well with Ultimate's symbiote tendrils because he's basically built around uh, crowd control and AoE combat. At its peak in the later levels, it genuinely starts to feel like you're playing a Dynasty Warriors game. It's honestly a lot of fun. Like I mentioned earlier, the enemies are also color-coded to represent what they do. The green ones in this section shoot beams at you from a distance, so you probably want to take care of them first. Once Electro summons the more powerful purple variants of the electric enemies, it pushes Ultimate into a rage. And I mean that literally, he has a rage mechanic. Yeah, he has a devil trigger. It's insanely fun. The screen is tinted red, you get new attacks, and you do a ridiculous amount of damages, which causes all enemies to pretty much go down instantly, even the much bigger and stronger ones. Each time you hit an enemy, the gauge will fill back up, so the more enemies that you can take down whilst in rage mode, the longer you can stay in it. For me, this made Ultimate the most fun Spider-Man to play as. Taking down a massive swarm of enemies quickly by building up and maintaining rage was a ton of fun. It's like they had a much more clear direction with Ultimate style of gameplay than they did with Amazing. Oh yeah, and uh, these blue ones. I don't think they move. I think they just stand there. All right, so Electro fight number two. He's being actively powered and shielded by all the electricity he's absorbed from the generators, so you can't attack him until he overexerts his energy and his electricity field goes down. He can also regenerate his health by absorbing energy from the generators. You have to attack him to stop him from doing that. It's a very passive boss fight because you have to just kind of wait for Electro to let himself become vulnerable, but it doesn't really take too long. Hey, uh, thanks for helping me work out my aggression. You know, I don't think that is supposed to happen. Electro is juicing himself a ton. He busts some of the generators and he fills the room full of volatile electricity just sparking everywhere. You have to save a bunch of civilians so that they can help you progress. Once you swing them over to a terminal, you have to defend them from a wave of enemies until they're able to shut down the electricity, allowing you to move on. You do this for all the civilians until the last two assist you in opening the door. Once opened, you'll be greeted by a gigantic Electro. Harmless light! <laughs> I honestly, I love this boss. Every time he does this attack, it plays like a vine boom sound, like he's using the hand. 
Every time he juices himself up, he lays a hand down for you to slam into the dam behind him, dealing damage to it. Then you web zip across these floating boxes to get to the other side, where he starts to slam his fist into the dam trying to hit you. Each time he hits a tile with the dam's flooring, it deals damage to the health bar. You basically just stand over the undamaged tiles until you get the dam's health low enough to perform a takedown on Electro and kick him into the water, where he will seemingly die. This was genuinely one of my favourite levels in the game. It was silly, it was fun to play, and uh, above all else, it was extremely varied, unlike a certain level. After you beat all four of the starting levels, a cutscene will play, and in the cutscene, Mysterio realises there are more fragments of the tablet that he does not have, and that he can become even more powerful if he obtains them for himself. So, uh, I'll just come out and say it. This is probably my least favourite level in the entire game, or at least the very least, it was one of the worst. The opening cutscene for this level has Amazing swinging through a sand-filled construction site. He finds the fragment immediately, but then Sandman erupts from the ground and takes possession of it. There's a pretty cool recurring gimmick in this level where you have to web zip across flying debris to traverse across the gaps, but they overuse it, you're gonna see it a lot. First thing blocking your path is a giant sand tornado, so you web pull the water tank to soak Sandman and prompt a boss battle. This establishes his weakness pretty much immediately. So under normal conditions you can't damage Sandman at all but there are conveniently placed barrels full of water everywhere around you so you just have to throw them at him and then you can attack him. Conceptually there's nothing really wrong with this this is usually the route they go with Sandman when they put him in a video game or just any type of media really it's, it's a well established weakness that he has. The problem with it in practice is that throwing objects in this game feels like sh and barely ever works. Locking onto a barrel in the first place is far more challenging than it should be, let alone actually getting amazing to throw it towards Sandman and not just onto the ground. The fact that web striking is also bound to the exact same button as throwing an object is extremely annoying. There are various times where I ended up web striking Sandman before I can even hit him because I'm just trying to grab a barrel. After you defeat Sandman, he'll run off somewhere and once you follow him inside, he'll create a bunch of little sand enemies. I despise these things. Just like Sandman, you can't hit them unless you soak them with water first, except there's multiple of them, so it's even more likely that you're just going to web strike one of them when you're just trying to grab a barrel. Fortunately, there are also these pipes that you can burst, which propels a jet stream of water that you can trick the enemies into walking towards. This is honestly a lot easier than relying on the barrels, but it's still just kind of a pain to have to do this to hit the enemies. As you progress, you're going to be swinging around the giant sand tornado, using the debris to cross large gaps without falling into the sand, and fighting a bunch of enemies on the platforms. You'll do this until you reach the water tank and then stop the tornado. There are also these big sand enemies. I hate them. Once you stop the tornado this time, you go inside of the mines where you'll face a giant sandman with rubble and debris sticking out of him. He slams his fist on you and there are more conveniently placed water barrels, so you just have to stand by them until he soaks his hand in water and allows you to attack it and do a ton of damage. After you've done this enough times, water barrels will just start coming out of nowhere. So you just throw them at him to soak his head and then start beating him up. That's the whole boss. Progress forward, you find yourself out of the mines and faced with yet another giant tornado. This is just a repeat of the section you did before. You go from platform to platform, fight these guys, web pull the water tank, stop the tornado. This level is not only aesthetically very bland and repetitive, but it's also mechanically repetitive too. You're just doing the same thing for the whole level, with just some very, very slight minor variation of it. There are other levels that are guilty of this too, but they were fundamentally less frustrating to play. After you stop the tornado again, he retreats into the mines again, and then you fight more sand golems again. Then you save this guy and he operates this drill for you so you can get through the mines. You have to protect the drilling machine whilst it's being attacked by big sand golems. I almost wasn't able to do this section because of how annoying these things are to fight. You swing towards the camera whilst being chased by Sandman, and then you finally enter the final fight against a powered up version of himself, which takes the form of three heads with different personalities. What is this? Is it Alien X? Do I have to get them to agree with me so they can stop making me play this ch level? Or is that just beyond his power? I want you to take a wild guess how you beat this boss. The second noir level starts with him providing some background on the Vulture, how he was the man who killed and ate his uncle. That is not the first time that Christopher Daniel Barnes has said that line. Unlike the previous noir level, this one takes place in a lot of very cramped alleyways, which doesn't really lend itself well to stealth. You chase Vulture through the alley until you find yourself inside of a club, where you enter a beat em up section. After beating them all, you continue your pursuit of Vulture. This section forces you to crawl on the wall, and there are spotlights moving all around the place, which you have to stay out of their line of sight. It's pretty janky to control, but I guess I see what they were going for. After you successfully sneak past, you can enter another beat em up section. It seems like Vulture is getting shaken up by your pursuit of him. So you enter a warehouse, which instigates the first boss fight with Vulture. The fight will proceed as normal until he starts hopping all over the place. Then, very politely of him, might I add, he just stands there until you shine a light on him, which will allow you to do a takedown on him and deal big damage. This will repeat until you defeat the boss. As you might expect, 
he runs away and you chase him again. But this section is a bit different from what you've experienced up until now. It's a much more open space on a bunch of rooftops where four civilians are being kept hostage. Once you save them all, you'll enter yet another beat em up section just before entering a tower that the vulture completely sets ablaze, knocking Noir unconscious. When he wakes up, everything is on fire and you'll have to scale your way up the building, simultaneously pursuing vulture and saving trapped civilians from the wreckage. You're on a timer as you do this since the tower has a health bar, but they're very, very generous with the time given so it doesn't feel very tense. When you finally make it to the top of the tower, Noir attacks Vulture and smashes him through a window. This is kind of where the level starts dragging on a bit. I've already been in this level for 38 minutes. This section just kind of feels like filler. You just chase him down some more narrow hallways and you take out an entire room full of goons. At last, when you finally have completed this part of the level, you can enter the final boss fight against a powered up Vulture. You get to avoid him taking a bite out of you in the punch out section, then you engage in what was pretty much the same exact boss from earlier. Except he throws Molotovs now, you can make him drop on himself to deal damage. Plus, sometimes when you shine a spotlight on him, you have to actually shine another one to be able to damage him. So Noir finally, after like 40 minutes, downs this crusty, bald-headed, dry-lipped loser and then takes the fragment away from him. Now this, this right here, this is a level. You know, cutscene, not anything we haven't seen before. Scorpion gets his hands on the fragment, runs away from 2099. Okay, these are my least favorite guys. Don't like these guys at all. They have shields and you got a web strike avoid them so you can go behind and hit them. It's just super finicky. This one in particular, he's smart. He figured out the method. He's got his back to the wall. Invincible. He's invincible. What am I supposed to do? This section has a bunch of scorpion eggs which explode on contact. You throw them at the door so that they dissolve them with the acid. After you do this, you'll be in a huge open space where a bunch of scientists need saving. I actually really like how this level felt as a set piece. There are members of the public eye fighting the mini scorpions and you fight both as you progress through it. It creates a very chaotic environment that you feel like you're straight in the middle of. Once you save all of the scientists, you have to protect them against an onslaught of scorpion enemies so that they can open the door for you to proceed. After you make your way through these hallways, you face off against Scorpion, but he says something interesting after 2099 demands the fragment. He mentions how that he's a monster and he was promised by a smart lady that if he brings her the fragment she can make him human again. A lot of the levels in this game are lacking a continuous narrative. You just jump from one scenario to the next, often with the villains having barely any connection with one another, such as going from Craven to Sandman. However, 2099 and Noir are exceptions to this. They hint at someone above them being in control, some kind of endgame boss that you'll eventually make your way up to. With Noir, it's obviously Osborne, and with 2099, we find out in the previous level that Hobgoblin was created by somebody, and now we discover that Scorpion is being used and manipulated, presumably by the same person to collect the fragment. Particularly, in the case of Scorpion, they manage to make you feel a sense of pity towards him. You know he's being manipulated, all he wants to be is just normal again. You'll find that most levels in this game don't actually bother to establish a story against the villain you're fighting or bother to make their motive any more nuanced beyond I just want to be super powerful because I'm super evil. So this was actually a nice surprise to me. Anyway, you'll fight against Scorpion for the first time here. You'll dodge his acid. When the acid makes contact with the ground, it will create eggs that you can throw at him to do a takedown. You then have to save a lot of civilians as they're being attacked by little scorpions. They actually have a collective health bar here. So I didn't bother to fight all of the enemies before saving them because it was actually draining very fast. Once you've successfully saved everyone, you swing down an enormous hallway to find a platform where a ton of public eye soldiers and scorpion mutants are brawling with each other. After defeating enough of them, the door will just kind of inexplicably dissolve. I'm just going to take this moment to mention once again, I like this charge attack. It's fun. 2099 takes the elevator up to the top of the skyscraper only for Scorpion to send everything crashing down. A free fall section where you have to maneuver in between falling debris serves as a transition into the final fight against Scorpion taking place in his hideout. We can tell from Scorpion's dialogue here that the person who put him up to this has lots of shiny arms and has a green and yellow outfit. If you're familiar with Spider-Man villains at all, it's pretty clear who he's alluding to. In this fight, Scorpion will go up to the sea and then perform a lunging attack at you. Once you successfully dodge it, you'll be able to attack him. As the fight goes on, he'll perform more and more attacks that you will have to dodge before he becomes vulnerable. When his health is low enough, he'll dangle himself above on the centermost platform. To damage him here, you have to throw the eggs at him, which causes the platform to shake and grow more unstable. You do this enough times, and eventually one of the ships will come crashing down on top of Scorpion entirely, finishing off the fight. 2099 remarks that despite having come out to fight the victor and obtaining the fragment, he feels terrible about what he's done. This level was one of the best in the game, in my opinion. It had a compelling, sympathetic villain, it avoided repetitive gameplay for the most part, and it had some very nice, interesting, varied set pieces. Okay, so for those unfamiliar with the Ultimate Spider-Man, 
Spider-Man comics, this level is not really going to make a whole lot of sense because Deadpool's throwing out references left, right, and center. And also, Ultimate Deadpool is vastly different from regular Deadpool. No, when you think of Deadpool, you'll probably think of his unique sense of humor, you know, his fourth wall breaks. He's got his healing factor that makes him pretty much invincible, he's got his iconic pair of katanas, he hates anime, and so when it was time to adapt him for the Ultimate Comics universe, Marvel said, hey, why don't we just do none of that? This version of Deadpool is an anti-mutant extremist who hunts down mutants for sport on a live game show. He only shows up for one arc in Ultimate Spider-Man, in which he tries to hunt down Spider-Man and the X-Men, only for them to revolt against him and then they blow him up. There's no healing factor, no meta humor. In fact, the only real similarity with his main universe counterpart is the name Deadpool. Shattered Dimensions version of Deadpool is the best of both worlds. He's got the same suit as the Ultimate version. He's got the whole game show murder island thing going on, but at the same time, he can also heal himself. He's got more of a sense of humor, and most notably, he can do the same fourth wall breaks we all know him for. Ah, you pause too much. You know what? I'm just gonna keep saying this every time you pause now. The premise of this level is laid out pretty clearly in the opening cutscene. Ultimate witnesses on the TV that Deadpool has one of the fragments, and the only way that Ultimate can get it is if he willingly participates in Deadpool's television show. Just like Alex mentioned, this is very clearly inspired by Ultimate Spider-Man. But unlike the levels before this, this level is not defined by linear progression. You're placed in an open hub on an oil platform in the middle of the ocean and it's full of Deadpool fanboys for regular enemies, and the objective is to destroy all of the cameras to progress. There's an obscene amount of emblems, and you'll see me trying to collect as many as possible. There's just so many. When you've destroyed all of the cameras, backup cameras will appear, and one of these backup cameras is placed inside a room which will lock itself once you enter, indicating the beginning of a beat-em-up section where you fight a ton of enemies, followed by a large enemy with a uh, notably silly name. Another room with a camera inside will have Deadpool hosting the Wadey Wilson show where Ultimate is a guest. Deadpool makes several references to the Ultimate comics, such as Peter's romance with the X-Man Kitty Pride, or the time Peter and Wolverine switched brains, that was a whole thing, never again. He also alludes to Jessica Drew, a clone of Peter who was created by Dr. Octopus, who is also a woman, but she also has all of Peter's memories and it creates the most extreme existential crisis known to man. Deadpool then knocks him unconscious. When Ultimate wakes up, you start the first boss fight against him. It's nothing really special, at some point he'll start to taunt and goof around, allowing you to do a takedown on him, which he'll do a couple of times until you beat the boss. You catch a ride on his boat and then you're brought to a second oil platform where you do exactly the same thing that you did on the first one. You go around smashing a ton of cameras. I've been in this level for 30 minutes and all I've done is smash cameras and fight one boss. When all the cameras are destroyed, you finally segue into the last part of the level. You have to swing across the ocean, zipping from container to container, whilst gigantic tidal waves periodically approach you. Near the end, a really massive wave starts to close in, and you have to zip onto a boat as it's being capsized by the wave, making a jump to an arena suspended in the air. You're about to get cancelled! This is where the final fight against Deadpool begins. He clones himself into three. All you have to do is defeat all three of them. There's nothing that really stood out about this boss, except that when there's more than one of them, they can do this really annoying move where they grab and start interviewing you. Fragment. So we've now defeated the second set of three sets of levels. As Amazing returns to Madame Web to show her the fragments that he has acquired, Mysterio follows him back and threatens her life. He showcases his new powers and threatens to kill Madame Web if Amazing does not retrieve the rest of the tablet fragments for him. With seemingly no other choice, he goes along with it. I'm just gonna assume that Madame Web relays this info to the other Spider-Men, I guess. Th the game doesn't really tell you. There may or may not be a burning question on your mind at this point. How come none of the Spider-Men have interacted with each other? That's a great question. You'd think the main appeal of this game would be the narrative opportunity for four different Spider-Men from different dimensions to be able to quip with one another, ask about each other's lives and histories, as well as just generally working as a group. Yet we're now two thirds through the game and they haven't said a single word to each other, let alone really acknowledged each other's existence. I feel like it especially sticks out in this cutscene. Why is Amazing the only one here? He's not the only Spider-Man gathering fragments. I mean, what if the other Spider-Men disagree and have a different plan of action. There's a lot more that could be done with this concept. I can't help but feel like it's wasted, especially since Edge of Time primarily revolves around the unique interactions between Peter and Miguel. However, this isn't to say that they don't interact at all in the game. There's still the final cutscene after you defeat the final boss. Anyway, so 
This kicks off the last four villains that you'll face in the game. For Amazing, he faces off against Juggernaut, which is instigated by a piece of the fragment getting stuck to Juggernaut's boot as he's running away from Silver Sable and generally wreaking havoc across the city. So Amazing does not have the best track record, with a somewhat average level, then in my opinion probably the worst level in the game. So let's see how this one pans out. You're immediately thrust into a boss fight against Juggernaut where he'll charge at you. Sometimes he'll do a leaping attack with a lot of landing lag giving you an opportunity to attack. In the latter half of the fight, he'll also start picking objects up and throwing them at you. When you clear this boss, he'll throw you through a building and you'll have to deal with Silver Sable, who has now marked you as a secondary target next to Juggernaut. To get past this, you just have to fight a bunch of guys wielding swords. They're a little bit more annoying than the normal enemies, but the moment you progress beyond this point, you have to face a ton of dudes with shields and a giant enemy, which is infinitely worse. This is where a skill that you unlock near the beginning of the game comes into play as an unexpected ace up your sleeve, Disarm. Almost every single enemy from this point onwards in this level is armed with a gun, which makes it extremely annoying to fight them when the game throws so many at you. But by pressing the web strike button you'll be prompted to mash it to disarm them. And what they don't tell you is that disarming is also a guaranteed knockout on the enemy. Which just means you can disarm any enemy with a gun that you see to just down them straight away. For most of this level you'll see in my gameplay that I'm just kind of disarming them most of the time. Eventually you'll find yourself confronted against Juggernaut and Silver Sable claiming to have him boxed in until he smashes into and levels a building. You hitch a ride on a helicopter and find out Juggernaut is heading to the Oscorp building. There's an open section where you fight a ton of Silver Sable's men, save some hostages, and then they assist you in fixing the fire leak so that you're able to progress. Then you have to scale your way up and chase Juggernaut all the way to the top of the building. When you find yourself up there, Juggernaut will sock the sh out of you and put you in a punch out section that has you ripping off his helmet and smashing his face in. You slam him through all floors of the building and that causes it to completely collapse. But this isn't the end of the fight, he awakens from the rubble and takes control of the fragment becoming more powerful, which starts the actual fight. This boss is kind of cool. He has some attacks where he leaps into the air, causes the ground to ripple, which you have to jump over, as well as causing dust to kick up and obscure your surroundings. And whilst this is happening, you can sneak up behind him to attack him and trigger a takedown. So long! After you finish the boss, Amazing knocks him out and takes the fragment for himself. Now, you're finally finished with all of Amazing's three levels. One of the weakest, if not the weakest character in this game. Now, this level surprised me the most out of any level in the game, because it was uncharacteristically kind of excellent, with only a few hitches here and there. Not at all what I expected from a noir level, since as I previously established, I do think his core gameplay loop is pretty weak and the previous two levels weren't exactly great, but his final level completely redeemed him for me. The opening cutscene immediately caught my interest because it showcased a carnival, one which Osborne is camped out in somewhere. One of his underlings warns him that Noir is on his way, but Osborne doesn't care. He wants Noir to confront him, eager to see how the fragment will power him up. He transforms into Goblin. This whole sequence really does set the level up to feel like a final showdown. I think this is the most visually stunning level in probably the whole game. The lit up carnival entrance along with the fireworks going off in the starry night sky in the background. It was a treat to look at but also achieved the nice kind of spooky atmosphere it was going for in the use of a carnival set piece. I only wish this game had the polish to execute some of the ideas here in full, because I think they're great ideas for a stealth game. The fireworks will go off in the sky every now and then, which will completely illuminate the entire area. Whilst everything is illuminated by the fireworks, you're vulnerable to being spotted. Unfortunately, stealth is pretty two-dimensional and laughably easy, no matter how well the level is set up, so this isn't something you have to take into account much at all. But I love the idea, and it's still really cool to see it implemented. Once you clear out all of the enemies, the mouth of the clown face door will open up, seemingly allowing you entry, but not long before a powered up goblin bursts out of it, slamming Noir to the ground. He really wants to step on you. Goblin effortlessly lays you out on the ground and then runs off, so naturally you pursue him, which leads you to the inside of a circus tent. I'm not even going to acknowledge that he's been calling himself the Goblin Victorious, because that is ridiculous. That is stupid. Shut up. The lights dim out inside the tent, and once they turn back on, there are a bunch of goblins underlings waiting to fight you, prompting a tried and true, a noir classic, that's right, it's a beat em up section. This section was pretty enjoyable to work my way through. Once you've saved all three civilians, they will open the clown mouth door for you. This is where the level plummets 
pretty hard. You enter a room full of clown faces and the game tells you to pull open the right door. Your health is rapidly draining as you're given the choice between a ton of different doors. In my opinion, this was a major pace breaker and the puzzle itself wasn't particularly great. I'll be totally honest, I could not actually identify what was different until editing this video back. I kept focusing on the candelabras next to the door, the teeth, the nose. It's none of those. One of the clowns has a really twitchy eye. And that's how you know it's the right one. But it's okay because we're back to peak. Oh, we're back to the doors again. All right, I've had enough of this guy. It's final boss time. You're in a big stadium facing off against Goblin and you have to attack his back until the lights go off. When the lights are off, you do a stealth takedown on him. Then he picks up a pillar and starts using it as a two-handed weapon. After he swings it down, it briefly gets stuck in the ground, which is your chance to attack his back again. In the final phase of the boss, he summons a ton of minions, and, well, this is pretty funny because you can make him wipe out his own minions with his sweeping pillar attacks. Once you've attacked him from behind for the final time, Noir launches himself out of a cannon like he's doing the Luigi missile and defeats Goblin, including Noir's set of levels. Just like Noir, here we are, the mastermind behind the previous two villains. Holy m- This causes the lab to explode. The freefall section here as you dive away from the impending blaze is really cool, featuring you dodging and weaving away from whatever these are and going through some funky tubes. Once 2099 lands, Doc Ock shows off her condensed matter reactor, the only one in existence. She intends to use the fragment to power it. When she does so, the resulting blast is so powerful that it sends 2099 flying. He figures out that the cables routing into the bottom of the condensed matter reactor all go in separate directions. This forms the basis of how the level is structured. There's a main hub with four different hallways in which you follow the gigantic purple glowing cables down to track down the source and destroy it. As far as I know, you can sort of do this in any order. I think this is a neat idea, especially for the Doc Ock level since she has, well, you know, four mechanical arms. It just feels appropriate. The first of the four cables is practically free, just to show the player what they're supposed to do. Follow the cables, destroy the energy core. The remaining three are up to you, I think. I just went for the one on the right first. The moment you step onto the platform, a giant mechanical arm boss fight begins. You just, you have to bait her into attacking the big glowing circle, which short circuits the arm, lets you climb up it and do a takedown, which does 50% of her health. Then you just do it again for the remaining 50%, destroying the arm, which lowers the force field and allows you to access the energy core and destroy it. With two left, I went for the one on the left this time and I was greeted by another giant mechanical arm boss. It's the same one. However, after you defeat this arm, you don't immediately get access to the energy core. You have to swing down a hallway, free a scientist, destroy the energy core, Doc Ock sets everything on fire again, you run away, you save the scientist, and then you're done. One more left to go. Before you're able to access beyond the force field, you have to clear out a room of enemies, then save three scientists, and then said three scientists will assist in taking down the force field that leads you to the final energy core. You know, presuming you went in the same order as me. Now that all the power sources for the cables have been destroyed, you can finally make your way back up to the condensed matter reactor where Doc Ock is waiting for you, prompting the final boss. She's completely protected by a barrier, shooting a bunch of lasers around the room which circle around and make the floor hazardous. You have to pull out these energy cores to make her vulnerable to your attacks. I think this is the first time I actually had to use accelerated vision, as you can tell from the attempts I made where I wasn't using it. For the next phase of the boss, she basically just walks around and lets out a shockwave of energy which will leave her susceptible to a takedown afterwards. You do this a few times until her final phase, wherein she forms a giant Jojo Stan-like construct of herself. She also summons two regular enemies and is constantly firing a laser that follows you. You have to guide the laser into the regular enemies, which will then cause them to drop these cores on death. These cores are the only way to damage her, so you have to throw them at her. Once that's done, you're beaten Doc Ock. I personally did not enjoy any of the boss fights in this level whatsoever, but the level itself was decently fun. I like the unique structure it had, if nothing else. Oh, we're finally here. The prophecy is fulfilled. I can make up for my mistakes. Ultimate swings by to one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. HQs with the intent of enlisting help from Nick Fury and some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, only to find that the place is decorated with flames and holes that have been ripped into the walls. Some of the shots in this opening cinematic are really great. We get the Five Nights at Freddy's style perspective from a security camera, as well as the shots of Ultimate Silhouette walking with the glow of the fire as the backdrop. Eventually, he stumbles upon a body that has been sucked dry, covered entirely in red goop 
which strikes a familiar chord. This is something he's experienced before. That's right, it's Carnage. The set piece for this level is pretty great, and I firmly believe either Electro or this level is Ultimate's best level. I particularly love how the camera takes on different perspectives to really sell the atmosphere of the set piece. As you walk down this hallway, you will not only get a frontal view of Ultimate, but a Resident Evil-esque camera in the corner of the ceiling, really selling that kind of horror feel. There's a section here where you have to fight an onslaught of symbiote-possessed zombies, so I'll take this opportunity to talk about why I think Ultimate's gameplay kind of reaches its peak here. At this point of the game, the final stretch, you will have most likely acquired a ton of upgrades for Ultimate, in particular for his Rage Meter. This means that not only does Rage last a long time by default, but you can extend its duration much more easily. So you spend almost the entirety of this level fighting against enemies in rage mode. The scientist explains that Carnage escaped whilst they were studying him and they also seem to have a hold on the piece of the fragment. Carnage must have powered himself up with it, which has granted him the ability to reanimate corpses. Great power comes with great responsibility, something you wouldn't understand. Josh Keaton is just killing it, man. A flamethrower robot tries to incinerate Carnage, but don't be fooled, this thing is your enemy too. Once you beat it, the door opens up and you're practically in the middle of an ongoing war zone. Your pursuit of carnage continues until you eventually end up in a vent, which leads you to some kind of containment unit for a bunch of actual symbiote monsters, not just reanimated zombies this time, these are straight up little carnages. You battle your way through this blazing prison, rescuing some scientists caught in the crossfire, and then you encounter a crashed helicarrier just before carnage leaps out at you and attacks you. Of course, throwing Carnage into the helicarrier causes it to explode into a fiery blaze, which is one of Carnage's well-known weaknesses. Or, you know, this version of Carnage, anyway. This first boss fight is a back and forth between you and Carnage until it decides to perch itself right by the helicarrier, allowing you to web-zip kick it inside and cause massive damage. Once you finish it off, Carnage retreats to the control tower. Just as you're about to chase it, a helicarrier in the process of crashing threatens to crash directly into Ultimate, who just barely manages to evade. Carnage hitches a ride on a flying contraption, so Ultimate follows suit, which brings you directly to the inside of the control tower. This will have you climbing up walls and walking across tight railings, as well as going through half-destroyed remnants of laboratories to make your way to the apex of the control tower. When you finally make it to the top, Carnage has planted a giant, disgusting egg in the center of the room. S.H.I.E.L.D. sends in some new flamethrower robots, except these ones are actually on your side. You have to defend them from the little Carnage offspring so that they can incinerate the giant egg and reveal Carnage inside, which will allow you to fight it directly. After taking enough damage, it will retreat back inside of its egg and you'll have to get the robots to incinerate it again, just as you did before. Well, that concludes Ultimate set of levels. That was a pretty nice way to end off, I think. We're at the end, but this isn't actually the final cutscene in the game, it's the cutscene that'll play when you finish the final set of bosses. Amazing returns, fragment in hand, but he doesn't really want to give the tablet back to Mysterio, so instead he hits his glass bowl with it. I'm not sure what the plan was here, I don't know why he couldn't have just thrown hands in the first place. See, this is the consequence of choosing now to throw hands of all times. The tablet pieces get drawn together, which gives Mysterio the power to break down the walls of reality and turn colossal. This is what we've been waiting for the entire game. Now that the walls of reality separating the dimensions have been shattered, get it? Shattered dimensions? Madam Web can summon the other Spider-Men to assist Amazing. What happens after she says this? The cutscene ends, and you're playing as Noir completely by himself. Okay, this is not a great start, but maybe they'll all be together in the final latter part of the boss. No. The final boss is divided into four sections, each for one Spider-Man with a transition between each one to the next. You start with Noir, and the only thing I have to say about this section is that it's just Scarecrow from Arkham Asylum. Also, Mysterio has a different design now. I don't like it. After you crack his head on the glass with a takedown, Noir will just sort of fall down and then it will transition into Ultimate Section. But there's zero interaction between Noir and Ultimate, nor is the transition actually natural. It just, it just inexplicably happens. Anyways, so Ultimate Section has these orbs floating around which summon enemies, and you have to web strike the orbs when they turn a certain color to deal damage to Mysterio. Whilst you're waiting for the orbs to shift into a damageable state, you have to stave off a number of enemies. This feels more like an assortment of mini games so far. 
rather than a final boss. Ultimate makes a cute reference here to the transition into 2099, but it feels incredibly stiff because there's no response from him. Of course, he also just phases out of reality and 2099 just pops into existence for his section. His section is the simplest of them all. It's just a freefall section. I mainly liked it because you get to see 2099 just absolutely wailing on his glass dome. In the transition between 2099 to Amazing, the final section to finish off the final boss, he pretty much does not say anything special and the transition is just as it has been for the previous Spideys, it's just a dissolve fade in. Amazing section was probably the laziest of them all because there was absolutely nothing distinct about it. You know, Noir had his stealth, 2099 had his free falling, and you could say that Ultimate had his big swarms of enemies, but Amazing just fights some guys on a platform and then moves on to the next platform, fight more guys. And that's it. That's the whole final boss. They did Mysterio Day. I was really excited to see him as the main antagonist of this game, but he genuinely has the worst boss fight in the entire game, bar none. There is a silver lining to this boss being underwhelming. After you defeat Mysterio, the final cutscene will play. Mysterio shrinks down to a corn cob, and Peter, 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 and Miguel walk up to him and tell him that he's outnumbered. In this brief minute to two minutes remaining of the entire game, we get to see the four Spider-Men passing Mysterio around for chain attacks and making quips about beating him up to one another. as well as them saying their farewells to each other when Madam Web returns them to their own respective dimensions. See you later, older and less cool versions of me. I, I can't fathom why this wasn't just the main focus of the entire game. For the record, I actually do like this game. I think it's pretty fun and I appreciate the ambition, albeit I do think it is very flawed in places. However, I probably siphoned more enjoyment out of the latter half of the final cutscene than I did out of the entire rest of the game. Purely just from seeing these guys actually speak to each other for the first and only time. Oh, uh, also Spider-Ham appears at the end. Now that we've covered the main game, I wanted to talk about some of the fun little extras that you can unlock. The alternate costumes. What would a Spider-Man game be without alternate costumes? For the sake of not confusing anyone in my gameplay, I just stuck to the normal costumes, but there's actually three alternate costumes for each playable Spider-Man that you can unlock with Spider Essence in the same way that you'd unlock a health upgrade or a skill. So for Amazing, he gets the Bagman costume, the Secret War costume, and the Scarlet Spider costume. The Bagman costume is a reference to Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 issue 258 where Reed Richards separates the Venom symbiote from Peter and leaves him butt ass naked. So he resorts to wearing a spare Fantastic Four costume and a bag over his head to maintain his secret identity as he gets back home. Now the secret wall costume kind of sparked this strange phenomena with its appearance in this game because this suit literally appeared for like maybe two panels. It was featured at the start of the secret wall storyline in 2004-2005 as an alternate costume that Spider-Man wears when working alongside Nick Fury. The reason why I say its appearance in this game sparked this strange phenomena is because this game continues to appear as an alternate costume in most Spider-Man games that follow this one, despite it honestly having like little to no actual historical relevance. And the Scarlet Spider costume is obviously a reference to Ben Riley, a clone of Peter Parker. This suit in particular made its first appearance in Web of Spider-Man Volume 1, Issue 118. Moving on to Noir's costumes, his first alternate costume is based on his original concept art created by Marco Jojevic. It has this leathery, hand-stitched look to it, and I've always loved this suit. His next alternate costume is Spider-Man 1602, which is a costume that is based on an alternate iteration of Spider-Man known as Peter Parkour, who goes by the name of The Spider. In short, it's Spider-Man in the Elizabethan era. The series Marvel 1602 was written by Neil Gaiman, and it's very fun. Noir's final costume is the Negative Zone outfit. In Spider-Man Volume 1 Issue 90, Spider-Man visits the Negative Zone to save three children, which ends up turning his suit black and white. 2099's costumes start off with Flipside, which is actually a character that is from the Spider-Man 2099 series of comics, specifically from Spider-Man 2099 Volume 1 Issue 29. In short, Flipside is an android with a ton of stored profiles on different superheroes from the 21st century. When he meets Miguel, the new Spider-Man of the 22nd century, he combines the profiles of Spider-Man and Venom, which makes him uh, a bit loopy. His next costume is the Spider-Armor Mark 1, which first appeared in Web of Spider-Man Volume 1 Issue 100, wherein Spider-Man has to stop the new enforcers, but he needs a bulletproof suit to counter their use of firearms. Thus, the Spider-Armor was created. The final 2099 costume is the Iron Spider, which is a suit built for Spider-Man by Tony Stark, first appearing in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 Issue 5. 
529. Last but not least, Ultimate's alternate costumes start off with the classic red and blue Bagley suit, so you have the option between Symbiote and no Symbiote, at least visually speaking. He also has the Electro Proof suit as an alternate costume, which first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 Issue 425, created by Spidey so that he'd be protected from Electro's powers. The final unlockable costume in our lineup is the Mungaverse costume. This guy's an entirely different iteration of the character from Marvel Mungaverse Spider-Man Issue 1. This version of Spider-Man is a ninja who comes from a clan known as the Spider-Clan. There was also a DLC pack released for the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions of the game, which added a unique cosmic suit for each Spider-Man. If I'm not mistaken, I think the PC version just kind of had these unlocked by default. So now that we've finished all the levels, the final boss, and we've taken a look at all of the alternate costumes in the game, all of the main content for the console and PC versions of the game is pretty much being covered. However, as I said at the beginning, I'll be talking about the DS version for a little bit. Not too much, because I want to cover the handheld Spider-Man games in a separate video and be able to go more in depth. But I'm mainly just going to lay out the differences between this version and the other version of the game I've just spent god knows how long covering. The biggest difference, well, other than the gameplay obviously, is that the lineup of villains is entirely different in this version of the game. Another major difference is that Ultimate isn't in this game at all. It's just amazing 2099 and noir and that there's only two villains per Spider-Man, not three. Amazing faces off against Electro and the Tinkerer, whilst Noir goes against Boomerang and Calypso, and 2099 fights Vulture and Silvermane. I think it's really cool that some of the console slash PC villains are swapped around in the DS version, such as Electro going from Ultimate to Amazing, and Vulture going from Noir to 2099. Oh, and Mysterio is still the main antagonist in the DS version, of course. Anyways, check out these two assisted speedruns of this game. I'm telling you, man, Miles does not want to run into Shattered Dimensions DS Spider-Man. And with that, Shattered Dimensions is pretty much done. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it, especially if you've been waiting for this video for like, I don't even know how long. So the first thing is that the Japanese Spider-Man video, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you because I'm blown away by all the positive reception to that video. It was a massive passion project. It's one of those videos where I wanted to make it before I even had the idea for the channel, you know? So I'm just really happy to see that it's, you know, done so well and people have liked it so much. We also hit a pretty major milestone recently. 10,000 subscribers, the big one zero 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 zero. That's pretty nuts, I'm not gonna lie. The next video is gonna be a big one on Miguel. That's right, Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099, just a big old, full retrospective on the character. That's the plan. And also, you might have noticed that the thumbnail for this video is a completely custom thumbnail painted by the amazing Isaac Drawman, who also painted my banner. I 100% recommend that you go check out all of his socials, especially go check out his webcomic if you want to see more colourful, beautiful paintings just like this one, but in the form of his own personally told story. His webcomic is a lot of fun, I massively recommend it. It's called Omni Apparatus. With any luck, I'll I'll be able to commission even more thumbnails from Isaac depending on how well the channel does but seriously go check him out he's a gem he's super talented and he's a lot of fun to work with because he's just as passionate about spider-man as I am that's probably a burning question on your minds where's the spider-man unlimited video you said that one would be next you know what that's a great question and you're absolutely right I did say that. Basically, I just felt like talking about something else. But I still want to actually tackle the show at some point. Like, I will be making a Spider-Man Unlimited video eventually, don't worry. But in the meantime, whilst you're waiting for that video, Johnny made an incredible video on Spider-Man Unlimited. And honestly, I'm not sure if I could have actually covered it any better myself. So absolutely go check out that video. And whilst you're at it, just go check out all the Spider-Man videos because it's honestly some of the best Spider-Man content you're going to find on the platform. Anyway, once again, I just wanted to say thanks for watching this video and huge thanks to everyone who subscribed because reaching 10k was just crazy. I still can't believe that there are people out there who find me talking about Spider-Man even remotely interesting, but I'm very grateful for the fact that, you know, people actually stick around to watch this, you know, my, my videos. Now, the real question is when are we covering Edge of Time? <laughs>